Hey, campfire crew, let's get it on. The Bad House by Anonymous I used to be a skeptic, even as a small child. I didn't really believe in hauntings and most paranormal stuff. But that changed after I lived in a haunted house. My family moved there when I was around 12 years old, and there was a bit of a creepy feeling in that new house that gradually got worse. Myself, my brother, and my sister all had frequent nightmares and a feeling of always being watched. After about a year there, my brother, who was five, began talking about the lightning and also refusing to sleep alone anymore, and he started hearing footsteps in the rooms, rooms that we knew no one was in. Then my mom bought some tarot cards and a book about fortune-telling and contacting spirits. She said that she found it lying on the side of the road. It might have been a coincidence, but that night was when things started to get bad. Objects and shelves and walls began falling down for no reason, and stuff began flying across the room and hitting us kids and some of our pets. This never happened where adults could see, so us as kids were told we were making it up. The footsteps and the sounds in the empty rooms were getting louder, and sometimes you could see shadowy things out of the corner of your eye. Around that time, my stepdad had kind of a breakdown. He started talking about three people always watching him and climbing up by the side of the house. His paranoia got worse, and he started talking about a bright, dark light and about these things coming for him. One night, he ran outside and began shining the flashlight up in the air and just screaming at something only he could see. A couple of days later, he tried to rob a gas station with my brother's squirt gun, and he went to jail. At that point, I began really trying to talk to my mom about stuff going on in the house, but she believed that if you were positive, any spiritual presence would be neutral or friendly to you. Finally, I was talking to her about it in the kitchen, and while I was talking to her, a jar lifted off of the fridge and flew across the kitchen and hit me in the head. The jar had rolled from the edge of the fridge and traveled over six feet through the air before hitting me. After that, she did listen to us, at least about the stuff flying around. After that incident, I decided I had to do something. As all these creepy feelings had kind of escalated over time, we realized that they had gotten worse the day my mom brought the tarot cards in that book home. So I decided to get rid of them. I carefully burned them outside of the house and buried the ashes in the vacant lot. For the rest of the year, the house was much quieter. and We had only the footsteps to hear and that creepy feeling of being watched. But things got bad again. And in addition to all the other stuff we had before, us kids started to see things that weren't just shadows, and not just out of the corner of our eyes. One night, I was sitting on the couch and turned a bit to the side, and I saw a hand resting on the back of the couch as if someone was hiding behind it and had reached one hand up. I turned to look at the hand and it quickly dropped down behind the couch, and when I looked, there was nothing behind it. We could all hear whispers and other noises coming from the empty rooms again, and sometimes they sounded like they were right behind us. The cats and dogs tended to run out of any rooms where we heard sounds right before something happened, so we started following the pets around. My mom still insisted that things weren't that bad, and no one else believed us at all. Finally, one day when I was babysitting my siblings, we packed up some of our clothes and toys and walked down the street to our grandfather's house and refused to go home. The cats all followed us over, and eventually my mom and grandma gave up trying to get us to go back to the house. And about a year later, my mom walked out of the house and never went back in herself. 
She never told us what happened to her. Our landlord walked in the house a few weeks later, and she walked back out, locked the door, and as far as I know, no one has ever been in that house since. There's still some stuff inside that belongs to my family, but none of us will go in after it. I Saw It by Bill P. This incident happened in the summer of 1992 in my hometown of Whitehorse, Yukon, while I was taking a walk with my mother in the woods near her home. At the time, I guess I was 39 years old and her about 60. This is the first time I've ever shared this story with the public. Being a sort of explorer kind of a person, I like to take walks in the woods and off the beaten track, so I have a better chance of finding something rare or interesting. For one, I'm a serious rock hound. And another, I'm a major local history buff, so I'm always off in the woods looking for something. Anyway, one evening I decided to take a walk down this old road heading into some pretty dense and very rocky forest. It was a cat road, and it was skinny, and tall trees were on each side, and the funny thing was it kept on twisting and turning back and forth and back and forth, so that at any given time, either forward or behind the line of sight was only maybe about 80 feet. I walked and walked and was sort of hoping to get somewhere. A clearing, an old cabin, or at least a change of terrain, but no such luck. I noticed it was getting close to dark, so I figured I'd better turn around and head back, which was probably about another hour and a half of a walk. I got back to my mom's just as darkness fell. Just for the record, during the whole time, I did not get any weird or scared feelings or anticipate anything about to happen nor did anything, which in retrospect has an interesting dimension. Point being, it was extremely silent. Almost too silent. The next morning I told my mom about the road and the fact that not far down there was an old dump where we might find some old bottles. Did she want to go check it out? She said sure. It was a beautiful sunny day, not a cloud in the sky, and it was about 20 degrees out. A perfect day for a walk. So, off we went. We got to the dump, which was a very short distance down the road. She checked it out, but found all the bottles broken. She didn't care, and was just enjoying herself and picking flowers. I asked her if she wanted to continue down the road for a while, and she said, Okay, but are you sure there are no bears around? And I said, I don't think so. I haven't heard anything, and I didn't see anything last night either. And besides, I'd been in those woods all my life, and I've never had any bear problems. I've seen a few, but they always take off, and they were all rather small black bears. We continued down the road, but just because Mom made me aware, I sort of walked in front of her 50 feet or so, and was looking around each corner of the bend in the road, sort of bird-dogging the scene. I guess at about the fourth or fifth bend, I did see something up on the rise to the left, maybe 80 feet away. It was standing and moving slightly from side to side. I stopped in my tracks. My mom stopped in hers, too, about 50 feet back and out of view. I turned to her and said, someone's up ahead. And I looked again, and there he was. I expected him to approach and say hi or whatever but that didn't happen. I took another look. The sun was behind him, and he was in the shade of the trees. The sun is never high up here. I noticed that this guy, besides being unusually big and tall, was also wearing black coveralls, and he had a huge mop of hair tapering from the top of his head to the outside of his shoulders. At that point, I was standing in the middle of the road. My bright purple t-shirt was glowing almost neon bright in the sunshine. I was waiting for him to approach, and I was staring at him trying to see his face, his eyes. But I couldn't make anything out. He was still swaying from side to side a bit, but otherwise just standing there. My mom was still about 50 feet back, and she was staying put. She didn't want to approach any further. She was saying, "'What? What is it, Bill?' And I said, I'm not sure. It was now about two minutes into this whole scene, and I was starting to feel weird. 
And I was staring at this guy, and he was staring at me, but again, I couldn't see his face. He was in the bloody shadows of the trees. Finally, I figure after about three minutes of this stare-down took place, I started to face reality, but I didn't want to. That's the only way I could describe my feelings. As soon as I realized what I was having the stare-down with, I got pretty excited. The first thing that came to my mind was that I didn't want my mom to see it, or for it to see her. I wanted to defuse the situation with no screaming, no jumping, no fainting, and no running. I was thinking of approaching it, but something told me not to. And anyway, it started to approach me. In a split second, I turned on my heel and told my mom, Hey, let's go. I never told her what I saw, and I didn't have to. By looking at me, she knew something was up. We walked at a quick pace, but I refused to run. I looked back at every corner, and at about the third corner, there he was, about 20 feet behind us. But as soon as I saw him, he was gone. Gone into the woods, absolutely silently, not a sound. He was huge. Two silent strides into the woods, and he was gone. That close encounter lasted about one second at most. I mean, so fast that my mind didn't even want to remember. But I did. And one thing for sure was that I was relieved he was gone and had gone in another direction. After that, we finally came out on the main road, and we went across and sat on a log in the woods on the other side. I brought out some sandwiches, and that's when I said, Do you know what I saw? She said, No. And I said, Sasquatch. I just saw a Sasquatch. She asked, Are you sure? And I said, Yes, ma'am. I remember guys around here talking about it. Apparently, it visits the village all the time at night and rummages around in their yards. Whatever I just saw has to be the same thing. I went home and drew a picture of it, and I went through it in my mind over and over again to keep all the details in memory. That was back in 1992, and I can still remember it very well to this day. A True Family Ghost Story by Cool Collection I'm a native New Yorker that is currently living in Portland, Oregon. My son Ryan had just been born in 1984 when my brother-in-law Ricky called me to congratulate me on his birth and tell me that he was proud of me. This was my second child and he thought I was just doing great. Ricky and his brother married my sisters at different times and both families were now living in the same duplex. Two weeks after I talked to him, Ricky was off that night and he was going to a party. A much-deserved break from working his main job, and his second job was a drummer in a band. He was really talented. Anyway, my sister was four months pregnant with their third child, and she told Ricky she'd leave the light on for him. Little Ricky always slept in her bed until Daddy came home and put him in his bed. My sister heard the door open and looked to see Ricky, completely silhouetted by the light, standing in the door to the bedroom. Ricky walked over to her and he bent down to kiss her, his light blue eyes shining through the darkness of the room. He reached over, lifted little Ricky up, and she watched him walk out of the room with him. When she rolled back over, she saw it was midnight, and she felt him get into bed. Around two in the morning, there was furious knocking on her door downstairs. It was unrelenting. Finally, she got up and answered the door and was rushed by her father-in-law and two New York State troopers. Her father-in-law made her sit down and they told her that Ricky was killed in a motorcycle accident with Herbie, his best friend, earlier that night. She told them that that was impossible as Ricky came home at midnight and put little Ricky in bed. She saw him. He kissed her and she felt him get into bed after putting their son to bed. So both her father-in-law and the cops were freaking out because there was another brother that lived next door who did take his brother's motorcycle out from time to time. But he had already left for his bakery delivery job. There was confusion. Could it have been him instead? 
Did they have the wrong brother ID'd? Then she said, I'll go get Ricky. She went upstairs, and he was not in their bed. So she started turning on all the lights in all the rooms of the house, running around screaming for him. She even went into the basement looking for him to no avail. During this time, the cops clarified that the other brother was, in fact, at work and alive. She, at that point, was freaking out. She kept screaming that she saw his blue eyes, that they must be crazy. Unfortunately, she was to find out that he had hit a station wagon head-on. Herbie was on the back of the bike. That intersection was notorious for accidents, and their deaths are why a light was put there in speed limit signs, since there weren't any before. Ricky went halfway into the car's motor at a high rate of speed. He was still on the bike, and the rupture of the tank caused him to burn and the car to catch on fire. Herbie was thrown from the motorcycle. Both of his legs severed. Neither of them survived. It wasn't until the father-in-law went over to view his son's body to confirm it was him when he noticed the only thing on Ricky that wasn't burned were his blue eyes. To this day, she says that Ricky came home. And he did. To say goodbye. Scary Ass Teacher Submitted by Rexpo One Not too long ago, you read a story about someone who was bullied in school. And that brought back some memories. This happened to me when I was a sophomore in high school. The first incident started then, and it was a teacher who, for some reason, decided to focus on me and give me a hard time no matter what I did. I should mention that my high school was fairly large, with about 350 kids in each class. Since then, the school has gotten much bigger, but back then, 1,400 kids in the same building seemed like a lot of people at the time. I didn't even have this teacher as a classroom teacher. He was just a science teacher on the second floor. And I think maybe some of this had something to do with him not liking my older brother, who had graduated a few years before me. My brother was kind of a pain in the ass, and I could see why people didn't like him or handle him well as a student. But I mean, I had nothing to do with that. I was a good student, did well in my studies. I was a very gifted athlete. But for whatever reason, and I'll call this guy Mr. Smith, he started landing on me for just walking down the hall one day. I was hanging out with my friends, just walking to class, and he literally grabbed me by the shoulder and spun me around and started yelling in my face that we don't use that kind of language at this school. <laughs> I hadn't even been talking. My friend Joe was telling me and my friends a joke, and Joe actually spoke up and said, Hey, I was the one talking. Mr. Smith just leaned into his face and said, Shut up and mind your own business and get to class. He was still holding on to my shoulder. I stood there not knowing what to do or say, and finally he just looked at me and said, Get out of my hallway, and gave me a shove. I got to my next class and was stunned for the entire period, wondering what I had done to piss that guy off. I let it slide and figured maybe he was just having a bad day. No big deal. But the behavior kept up. Any time I walked near his class and he happened to be in the doorway, he would start yelling at me. I finally stopped one day after about two weeks of this, and I said, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, what am I doing to make you so angry? He flipped out, grabbed me by the back of the neck and threw me into his classroom, and then wrote me up and sent me to the office. Again, I was shocked. But I did what I was told, and I went down to see the principal. The principal asked me what I had done to get into his office. I had nothing to say. I didn't know. He read the referral and scrunched his nose and looked back at me. He knew I was a good kid, and he knew my parents very well. They had all graduated together from the same high school I was attending. Without saying anything else, he got up, left the room, and then came back in. He looked at me and said, Do I need to call your dad? And I said, Mr. Jonas, no, I don't think that that's necessary. And he said, okay, I just need you to behave the best you can. 
And then before he told me to leave, he said, Do yourself and me a favor. Avoid that part of the hallway. I don't know if he knew that something strange was going on, but I got the vibe that he did. And that'll play out later in the story. So, I avoided that part of the hallway like the plague, even though getting to some classes made it a little tricky. And I was getting into my classes by the skin of my teeth. By the end of the year, I rarely saw Mr. Smith, and I didn't have any more run-ins with him. Junior year was different. The stars aligned, and not in my favor. I had Mr. Smith as my chemistry teacher. And this is where things started to go off the rails. Immediately, from day one, the first day of school for crying out loud, you know that day where you don't really do anything except go over the syllabus and what the courses were about? Yeah, he tore into me in front of everyone. He actually made fun of my clothes. This was in the late 80s, and I was really into those oversized rugby shirts. I mean, everybody was back then. My parents spent a lot of money on my clothes, and I'd saved up all my money for clothes, too. I certainly didn't look like a bum. I had no idea why he tore into me, but he said that I needed to pay more attention to my hygiene and wardrobe. Mind you, as an athlete, I showered three times a day. Matter of fact, my friends made fun of me for it, that I showered all the time. If they called my house looking for me and I didn't come to the phone, they immediately assumed I was in the shower. Yeah, go ahead. Insert masturbation jokes here, you sucks. At any rate, it was clear Mr. Smith was only doing this to humiliate me and get a rise out of me. No one in the class appreciated it, and no one laughed. But there were a lot of what-the-fuck looks going on around. No one said anything. Soon, over the next couple weeks, it became more and more evident that he was being a dick just to be a dick. Constantly calling on me, and even if I had the correct answers to his questions, he would drop comments like, Oh, I see we're finally using that brain to accomplish more than memorizing football plays. Or, I can't believe you actually know this stuff. I mean, nothing huge, but it was annoying and unnecessary and done on purpose. I started dating my girlfriend at that time, who was also in the class, and that became a thing once he found out. Constant lines to her like, What do you see in this moron? And, I'll help you out. Get rid of this guy now and you'll be happier in the long run. Again, he would say these things in front of everyone. It became quite the talk of the class. And when Mr. Smith noticed that they were talking about the things that he was saying, he openly accused me of whining to everyone about how hard of a teacher he was and how I was struggling with the material, which I wasn't. I did talk to my dad about it at that point. And although my dad is no pushover... He told me to do my best and ignore it, and just, quote, prove the asshole wrong with your work. About halfway through the year, everything in my life was going well. I had been recognized as an all-state player on the football team. I was getting sniffs from college scouts for ball and my academics. My girlfriend was awesome, and I was doing very well in all my other classes. But then I started to flunk Mr. Smith's weekly quizzes with correct answers. I'd get a 4 out of 10 and then realize that I had written the right responses down, and then I would take him up to him and say, hey, what's going on here? He would look at my paper, grunt, and then change the grade grudgingly. One time, I even got a lab back that my partner had gotten a perfect score on, but I received a 20%. When we both brought it up to him, again, he just changed my final score. Mr. Smith even sent a notice home that I was not performing well in class despite the fact that it was a lie. My mom had a conference with him and brought up all these things, but he played it off like it was just some kind of oversight on his end with the grades, and that he teased all the guys in the class anyway. That was totally incorrect. He only picked on me. I was playing basketball by that time, and one night after regular practice, I was in the gym just taking free throws. My teammates were gone, and everyone was gone, except for my coach who was in his P.E. office at the time. I was just totally zoned in, shooting free throw after free throw, when suddenly, 
I got walloped in the back of the head so hard I actually fell down. I watched as a basketball bounced away off to my left, and I got to one knee and looked behind me. There was Mr. Smith standing there smiling, and he said, Hey, heads up. And then he just turned and walked out of the gym. I'd had enough. I wanted to chase after him, but I thought better of it and went to my coach and told him everything that had been going on. My basketball coach was a great guy, still is. He listened to me and said he'd talked to Mr. Smith about all of this. They had gone to school here together and knew each other pretty well. He did, and for a little bit after their conference, Mr. Smith left me alone. Then, one night on a date with my girl, we were seeing some NC-17 flick, and I don't remember what it was. As we were getting our tickets taken, Mr. Smith showed up out of nowhere and started yelling about how I was 17 and shouldn't be allowed to see a movie like that. I mean, what the fuck? Of all the petty shit... The manager asked me if that was true, and I said, yeah, I'm 17, so what? But he said that they had a strict policy and couldn't let us in to see the movie. Mr. Smith just stood there smiling. I gritted my teeth, took my girl by the hand, and left without saying a word. She was more pissed off than me and said something had to be done about this. We just went to a mini golf and arcade place and met up with some friends for the rest of the night. As the seasons got warmer and hoops were over, I was gearing up for track and doing a lot of running to get ready for the season. On one of these solo long runs, I would go through a park near my neighborhood and just put in some long miles. One evening, on my way home, running through the park, a car came up slowly behind me then suddenly blared its horn and sped up right at me. I jumped off the road and into a ditch full of water, and when I looked up, I saw who I swear was Mr. Smith behind the wheel of the car racing past me. Now I was pissed. All my patience went out the window and I threw everything aside. The next day I went right to his classroom first thing and he was sitting at his desk. I was pissed and point blank said, What's your fucking problem? He sat there for a second and was taken aback. Excuse me, what did you just say? He said as he stood up. And I said, you heard me. I don't know what your problem is, but fix it and leave me the hell alone. No more. I then picked up a book from his desk and threw it at the wall and walked out. Sure enough, 20 minutes later, I got called down to the office. Same shit. But Mr. Jonas said this time, look, I'm bringing your parents in with him and we're settling this for good. Another conference was called, and my parents came in, and everyone was sitting around a table laying out everything that had been going down. Mr. Smith tried to weasel out of everything, but he was getting caught in his own lies, and eventually he was busted, and he knew it. An arrangement was made for me to finish chemistry with another teacher, and I promised I wouldn't antagonize or start anything for the rest of the year. No one addressed what had happened outside of school, but I figured my issues were settled with school and that's all I needed at that point. I do know that he got written up somehow and there was something in his file. I did catch that from the meeting. He didn't look happy about it. So, my story's over. Not that scary, right? But wait, there's more. That summer, I was walking home from my job in a store that was in a plaza in my town. I was cutting through the parking lot at around 9.30, thinking about my girl and calling her to set up our weekend together. I never noticed there was a car with no lights off to my side, until its engine roared. The car sped at me, and fight or flight kicked in immediately. I hauled it towards some Jersey barriers where work was being done on the parking lot, and just made it over them when the car smashed into the concrete. I laid safe on the other side in the broken blacktop and gravel, and then I heard a car door open. I also heard a car horn. The car's horn was stuck and it was blaring really loudly. And I looked around to see who else was in the lot. There was nobody else in the lot, other than Mr. Smith, who was getting out of his car with blood running down his face. 
He had a nightstick or something like that in his hand, and he looked at me and pointed this thing at me and said, I get the last say, you little shit. I should have run and called the cops. I should have gotten out of there. I mean, the guy just tried to run me down, for Christ's sake. But I didn't run. I was beyond angry. I stood up and said, Come on, fucker, let's go. He tried climbing over the barrier, but I ran at him and pushed him back. I was over the barrier in a second, and by the time he got his balance, he swiped this nightstick thing at my knees, but connected with my shin, and holy shit, did that hurt. But I was full of adrenaline at that point. He stood there breathing hard, blood coming down his face behind his glasses, and I was ready to take my shot when another car came screaming up and I heard a voice yell, Stop! Knock it off! Now! I turned to see a village cop car and an officer I knew getting out of the cruiser. Mr. Smith took another swing at me with the club, nailing me in the small of my back, and in pain I swung back around with my hand in the air, lining up his face for a solid punch. But by that time the cop was right at my side and grabbed my arm. Don't do it, kid was all he said, and I backed down. Man, I wanted to fuck that guy up, and he was in no shape to defend himself. Had that cop not got there, I would have kicked the shit out of him. Mr. Smith had banged up his head pretty good when he crashed into the barrier, and I think that's what the cop was seeing. Anything that happened to him could be blamed on me if I had touched him. A few seconds later, another cop car came up and Mr. Smith just leaned back on the hood of his car. They got him handcuffed and he was screaming all this death threat shit at me. His car horn finally gave out and things got quiet, except for all these people suddenly were surrounding us in the parking lot. Yeah, where the hell were they five minutes ago? The cops started questioning Mr. Smith and then put him into a car to wait for an ambulance. And more cop cars showed up. A couple of them walked me away from him. I remember my dad telling me something about always trust the police, but don't say anything unless he was there if I got into trouble. So when they started asking me questions, I told them I wanted to wait for my dad to show up, and they said okay and made arrangements to get a hold of him. When my dad did show up, Mr. Smith was still ranting and raving and being put into an ambulance. My dad was just holding my shoulder saying, you okay, little buddy? That made me smile. My dad was 5'5", five five and I'm 6'2". After that, we started to sort through things. Mr. Smith was more than three sheets to the wind. They found a bottle of whiskey in his car. He had just come from some other bar, and his BAC was a .24. He'd gotten drunk somewhere, was on his way home, and saw me in the parking lot. That's when he decided it would be a good idea to try to run me down, and then, after crashing, decided it was a good idea to get out of the car and try to fight me with his club. I pressed charges, used all of the other evidence from the past year against him. He got a DWI, reckless endangerment, reckless operation of a motor vehicle, but that was it. He pled down all these other higher charges about hurting me. I mean, can you believe that? My parents were over the moon pissed with his deal. Oh, and his teaching job? He claimed that he'd been under a lot of pressure for the last couple of years because his wife had cancer. They ended up giving him a leave of absence, and he actually kept his job and went back to work after a year away. I mean, can you fucking believe that? I got through school and into college, but it took me years before I ever got over that guy. I wanted to tie that fucker into a pretzel that night and just beat the shit out of him. But that's not the path I was supposed to go. Despite him getting off lighter than I thought he should have, in hindsight, I guess it was for the best. I found out he died last year, and as I mentioned, I heard a recent story on your channel, and it just brought back these memories. To this day, I can't say why he decided to pick on me and then actually try to kill me. I guess I'll never know. I had all of the means in the world to fuck that guy up three ways from Sunday. But, again, looking at it from now, it wasn't the right thing to do. Anyway, that's my crazy story about a crazy teacher. 
You know, teachers are supposed to help kids, not bully them or worse. But it goes to show you, there's assholes in every walk of life. I'm glad the biggest one in mine didn't do any more damage than he did. I'm Not Following You by Fuzzy Huzu. I take a walk every morning as part of my wake-up routine. This morning, towards the beginning of my walk, I passed a man who asked me something. He was slightly too close to me, but not enough to make me uncomfortable. Just enough that I didn't want to slow down or listen to what he had to say. I had my earphones in as well and didn't take them out, but I heard enough that he had asked for the time. Without breaking my stride, I glanced at my watch, said 7.30, and kept walking. If he said anything else, I didn't hear. About 20 minutes or half an hour later, well far away from the first time I came across this guy, the same guy walked up from behind, again too close to me, to ask again about the time. I told him at that point to get away from me, stop following me, and that I already gave him the time. That escalated things immediately because he shot back, Why? Is it because I'm black? I responded, No. It's because you approached me about a mile away with the same question. He then said he lived in the neighborhood. So I said, fine, but please stop following me. He denied following me and called me a ching-chong bitch and yelled for me to go back to China as I crossed the street to put more distance between us. The guy followed me across the street and kept following me as I crossed back over. At that point... I was yelling for him to get away from me and stop following me, and he was repeating the same lines about being black and hurling racial slurs at me. I was getting worried that while there were people out at 8 a.m. either walking their kids to school or going to work, no one was going to step up because of the bystander effect. After I crossed the street for a second time, he got right in my face yelling about how he wasn't following me. I had my back against an apartment complex, and I was getting worried that things were about to get physical when a tall woman with pink hair walked up. I don't remember what she said, but I at some point confirmed to her that he was not leaving me alone. She was about the same height as this guy and started to yell at him to stop following me. He was now being badgered by her and also yelling back the same denials about not following me, being from the neighborhood, and saying that this was all because he was black. Thanks to my lady savior, I was able to break away, and a couple that was exiting their apartment who witnessed all of this asked me if I was all right, to which I said yes without stopping. I walked half a neighborhood block down to duck through an alley, and as I was walking down the alley, checking the entire time to make sure the guy wasn't following me, I saw the woman with the pink hair disengaged with him and was walking off. I'm so glad it didn't escalate for her, and I feel bad for not being able to thank her for her help. I then took a circuitous route home, looking over my shoulders every once in a while. Voices from the Corner by Wicked4451 This is a story my dad told me many times, and I thought I'd share it with you. In 1966, when my dad was little, around 13 or 14, he had begun reading what I like to call no-no books, black magic-type evil books. One night, around 2 or 3 in the morning, my dad got up to use the restroom, and when he came out of the bathroom, he heard what sounded like whispers coming from his room. At first, he thought it may have been my grandparents talking in their room, but as he sat and listened, he noticed it was coming from the opposite side of the room from where his parents' room would have been. My dad finally pinpointed where it was coming from, the upper corner where the walls and ceiling meet. My dad told me that he didn't recognize the language the voices were speaking. He said it sounded like a dead language, one not spoken for a thousand years or more. The voices also came through with a heavy hint of static, like an old radio station that's hardly in range. Freaked out, he called for my grandfather to come in. 
My grandfather opened his door and froze. Who's in here with you? My grandfather asked. I don't know, my dad said, pointing to the corner of the room. At that point, the whispers had evolved into normal speaking volume. My grandfather walked in and listened for a moment. What have you been doing in here? he asked my dad. Without speaking, my dad pointed to a book beside his bed. My grandfather was a pastor at their church, and his face grew very pale. My grandfather grabbed the book with one hand and his cross he wore around his neck in the other, and my dad and he walked into the living room. My grandfather built a little fire in their fireplace, and at that point my grandmother had come out in a robe and asked, What's going on? Don, that was my dad, I told you no TV this late. My grandfather looked at his wife in horror and said, Honey, that's not the TV. Once the logs in the fireplace began to burn, my grandfather tossed the book inside and waited. Once it caught fire, the voices turned to screams that rattled the windows. They lasted about seven seconds before everything went silent. I've asked my grandfather about this story, but he always cuts me off and snaps, We do not talk about that night, period. My grandmother's always said pretty much the same thing, only nicer in her granny way. My dad has told me this story a dozen times, and it's always captivated me. What were those voices? What were they saying? Was my dad close to opening up some kind of portal? I don't know, but I do know he never picked up a no-no book again. From Skeptical to Scared I've always loved scary stuff. Films, books, and games but I never believed in anything paranormal. I've had some weird stuff happen, but I've always ignored it and shrugged it off. There must be a rational explanation. Then, a few years ago, my friend wanted to do one of those paranormal ghost hunts that was taking place in our local area. I thought, why not? I've watched loads of TV ghost hunts. It'll probably be fun. And it was, for the most part. The building we went to had a really horrible history, but there was a big roaring fire and comfy seats, and the atmosphere was cozy rather than scary. They even fed us loads of tasty food, and it felt like we had gathered around to tell scary stories. I never felt frightened once. A couple of strange things happened, and a spirit box clearly said my name, but that definitely wasn't evidence of the paranormal. I put it down to coincidence. In the middle of the night, the investigators got a Ouija board out and asked for volunteers. My friend and another person in the group wanted to do it, so I decided to join in, too. It started spelling out words almost immediately, and I didn't pay much attention to what it said because I was so focused on watching the other two to catch them out moving the pointer. I wasn't moving it, so obviously it was one of them. Except I was paying such close attention... I realized there were times only my finger was touching the pointer, and it still moved. I didn't understand how, and I asked to look at the board at the end because I was convinced there must be magnets or something. As soon as it was done, out of nowhere, I realized I was really, really tired, just totally exhausted. One of the people in charge of the group who said he was a psychic seemed really concerned, and I had to reassure him that I just wasn't used to being up at that hour. I'd been up since before 6 a.m., and it was now 4 a.m.-ish, so I just wanted my bed and chose to leave early. I got home, gave my dog some attention, and went to sleep. The next morning, I heard some weird noises that seemed to be coming from the door when I was in the bathroom. I thought it was quite weird, but I ignored it probably a draft or a vibration from somewhere. I went into my bedroom and started getting dressed. Then I heard my dog being silly on the other side of the bed behind me. He's a German Shepherd dog and very big, so he was making quite a bit of noise, and it sounded like he was digging under my bed. I turned around to talk to him and see what he was doing, 
but he wasn't there. I checked under the bed and all around the room, and nothing. My dog was downstairs. That actually freaked me out, because I definitely know what I heard. Over the next couple of weeks, I checked for mice, because what else could it have been? Smaller things started to happen. Stuff like being certain I saw something move on the other side of a room out of the corner of my eye, and strange noises. Sometimes things would just fall. A book falling off the table, or a stack of plates clattering on the drying rack. I ignored a lot of this. Oh, I just heard a plate hit against another plate in the kitchen. Must be a draft in there or something. But other stuff I couldn't explain. Once I was home alone, and I had just cleaned around the house and had been chilling on the sofa watching TV. I decided to get a drink or whatever, and I walked into the kitchen and saw some fruit roll the length of the counter. The fruit bowl is tall, and there's no way any fruit could tumble out. It was only about a third of the way full. No one else was in the kitchen. I just couldn't explain it. Some things that happened were frightening. I'd be home alone and hear someone walking around upstairs. It was a different sound than the usual creaks. More than once, I woke up to my dog standing in the doorway of my bedroom growling. He wasn't much of a growler, and it terrified me. I'd go check, expecting an intruder. The worst thing by far that happened was the last. It was a weekend morning, really bright and sunny. I woke up super early, let my dog outside, and we went back up to bed. I had a coffee and a book and was just planning on chilling out for a bit. After a bit, my boy jumped off the bed and looked out the bedroom doorway, then just laid down, so I went back to my coffee and book. Then out of nowhere, there was the loudest crash that came from the loft. I jumped. My dog jumped, and then it sounded like something was falling down the loft staircase. There was the noise of running up and down the stairs, and it was like all hell broke loose. I could have sworn there were at least 20 people up there just throwing things as hard as they could off the floor and walls, kicking things, running around like crazy. I could hear things smashing, and it went on for a while. I was absolutely terrified. I could have sworn there were people up there. I heard running on the stairs, but couldn't see anyone. And when it stopped, neither me or my dog dared move. I didn't take my eyes off the stairs and eventually went up with my phone, ready to call emergency services. But there was nobody there, and nothing was out of place. I've got no explanation. I posted this, and someone reached out and told me to ignore it as best I could, and it would go away. It did, and this was years ago. I'm in the same house, though, and recently had a few weird experiences happen that's left me feeling a little unsure. I'm not really sure why I've typed all that up, really. I read somewhere that weird experiences can restart at any time, and that really freaks me out. Has anyone else had a long break and then things start up again? The stuff that happened before doesn't even seem real. Always Lock Your Doors by Nick the Dog Dad I'm a 23-year-old guy here. I live in a pretty safe neighborhood and usually always lock my doors, but one night I apparently didn't. It wasn't too long after I had taken my dogs out for the last time and I was turning off the TV and lights when one of my dogs started growling. It's not too weird since he sometimes does that when people walk by the house. He only does it to certain people, though, not everyone. I then heard the front door open and someone walk in. My dog then started barking. My other dog, who loves everyone, came running from the other room to greet our guest. At the same time, I was reacting to what was happening and said, What the fuck? Who are you? Standing in the hall was a guy in his mid to late twenties. He was skinny and tall. Um, oh, wait, I don't think I'm in the right place. He genuinely seemed confused. I replied with, Hell, no you aren't. 
Please, get out. He apologized and said he was coming to hang out with a friend and just accidentally went to the wrong place. I asked him what house he was looking for, and he said a number that was just a couple of numbers off from mine. He apologized again and left. He seemed nice and non-threatening, but I was still kind of spooked. The next morning, I was ready to laugh the whole thing off. I was planning on telling my neighbor, a couple in their thirties, what had happened. I didn't know them all too well, but we had talked before, and luckily I caught one of them when I was out walking my dogs. I didn't want to come off like I was mad or scared over what had happened, so I casually said, Hey, I'm sure he told you about it, but your friend paid me a surprise visit last night. My neighbor gave me this confused look and said, What are you talking about? I said, Your friend. He walked into my house last night thinking it was your place. My neighbor was quiet for a second and then said, I don't want to alarm you, but I have no idea what you're talking about. We didn't have a friend over last night. Hey gang, thanks for listening to this episode of Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories. If you have a true scary story of any nature that you'd like to hear narrated on my podcast or this channel, email it to UncleJoshTrueScaryStories at gmail.com. I read them all. Please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Leave a comment below. I love to read those, and I respond as quickly as I can. And you can follow me on social media. Links to that are in the description. If you'd like to take your support a step further, find a link to my Patreon page, as well as my storefront at tpublic.com. Get yourself some Uncle Josh and Campfire Crew merchandise. Still working on getting the live campfire up and running. Just need to pick a date. And I've got a lot of something going on in the background here too, folks. Some of you who have been around with me for quite some time know that before Uncle Josh's True Scary Stories, there was the Edge of the Unknown radio show here in my area on WECK before it went to all internet. I've got a lot of people pressuring me to start that back up. If you haven't ever heard any of those episodes, look through my videos and give them a listen and give me some feedback. Would you appreciate hearing those long-form interviews with really, really cool guests? I have an inclination that I'm bringing it back. That will not affect Uncle Josh's true scary stories, though. Just additional stuff, and, man, I kind of do miss the edge of the unknown. Anyway, everyone, be excellent to each other. And until next time, be wary of things that go bump in the night. It could be anything. A ghost, a monster, or the guy next door. <laughs>